Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. We've got uh, Jackson Garner here, and you've already met Sumner Evans. Uh, they've done a lot to put on the competition this year. Um, and uh, for many years in the past, um, it's great having you here with us. Uh, so what do you think you've learned running this competition uh, from the past three that um, uh, Color School of Mice has done? Yeah, so this one's been kind of crazy because it's just been so big. Um, like. We've got more teams than ever, and uh, we've actually run into a lot of logistical problems there, such as Zoom uh, not letting us make enough breakout rooms. Um, but also, like, so far things have actually been fairly smooth despite that. Um, we've been able to, like, get clarifications answered and get everyone to submit on the first problem. Um, so it's been really cool seeing, like, how much the different, how much experience the different teams have, and uh, kind of how well they're doing, despite this being like a remote and kind of weird competition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that uh, one thing that we learned from last year, especially, was uh, um, uh, kind of how to how to set the problems correctly and and get a get a good mix of problems uh, we might have gone a little bit too easy this year because looks like k has been solved now um but uh i think that overall we've we've done a fairly good job of getting a good balance so what do you need to do in terms of like running this competition and reviewing problems in order to get that sufficiently wide range where both new teams have fun and these experienced teams have a challenge that can keep them occupied for the full three hours yeah so i think um in the past we've kind of like made a handful of kind of challenging problems and at the very end toss on a, like a couple of easy ones that we make specifically to be easy uh, but i noticed this year uh especially colin did a really good job of uh designing like straightforward problems. Um, a lot of the ones that kind of filled out the bottom and stuff, he helped. Uh, and his help there, uh, I think what he did was kind of focused on that bottom part without explicitly going like, I'm gonna make an M climb or like a multiply two numbers together problem. Like something that had a for loop, uh, which in the past we haven't really had as many problems like that. So what, what aspects of a problem then do make it like challenging for high schoolers or, or uh, at, at a level there where um, we feel comfortable bringing into this competition yeah. or that we really think they may have trouble approaching it and they'll occupy them for a good job. I think so I think uh, so we kind of have a, a, a sort of list uh, a ranking of problem difficulties with the first like level one being stuff to where kind of like M climb where it is just to multiply by uh, two numbers together um, all the way up to nine, which is uh, something that requires um, CS knowledge, you know, either of state machines, graph theory, um, complex data structures, um, parsing or other topics that may be covered in some 300 or 400 level class in college. Um, and We've kind of developed this over the the past now three competitions and using some just simple analysis of how many teams have solved uh, have kind of come up with this scale. Um, and I do think it really helped us this year to accurately estimate the com uh, difficulty. Um, you know, this year is probably going to skew it a little bit because we might have underestimated or overestimated the difficulty on a few of these um but that's i think better than in the past where we heavily underestimated the difficulty of a few problems that, that was a, especially a problem last year um where so uh, um go ahead i was gonna ask so jack is are there any like algorithms or data structures you saw in the problems this year that you think will make these problems particularly that, that are are helping some of these problems hold on yeah, I mean, I think the dynamic programming, like that's hard for, you know, college students, right? Um, so it's really impressive that we've gotten two solves there. Um, but that's what I've kind of noticed a lot, a lot of the really good, like 
ones that push people are hard, even for like college students and stuff. Um, uh, another one was, I think, the um, L, the one where you had to parse the math and stuff. Um, I've heard, like, you know, there's some pretty clever stuff you can do with eval, uh, but doing it without eval can get kind of tricky. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a topic of uh, basically a topic of programming languages or uh, theory of computation. Um, it, it is yeah. a very small subset of, of those problems, but uh, as, as we both know, having taken the theory of comp, like that's not a easy, easy class by any means. Yeah. So, and that's one thing I've noticed is that, um, like picking a problem that's like almost like it wouldn't be, um, crazy to see as homework in a 300 or 400 class and putting it in there is good to fill out the top end. So uh, in the months leading up to this competition, uh, you two have to manage a lot of volunteers and get students from minds contribute problems. What is kind of the process there in the timeline? What, at this year, we have 13 problems. When do you like have enough problems and can move forward with the competition? Yeah, so um, we basically took every problem we could get this year. Um, so like if it was completed, we added it. Um, and then we just made sure while we people were picking what they wanted to do, uh, we would go over them and talk about them in the chat and uh, kind of make any adjustments if needed, like talk about difficulty. Uh, so we really kind of let in any problem. Um, and luckily, everyone was really good at making them. Um, and then we just yeah tried to keep track of what was hard and what wasn't. And at the very end, um, a few of us kind of added a few where we thought there were holes. Yeah, and so, this process starts m many months ago. Um, we started, uh, I guess we really started in like at the very beginning of last semester, so kind of August, September timeframe. Um, but I know personally, I think about problems throughout the, uh, throughout the year. In fact, I have two um, problem ideas already for, for next year. Um, we'll see how those go. Um, but it's a it's a long process and definitely uh i think it's, it's pretty pretty cool to see um all of that work coming to fruition here uh in competition yeah and i think uh we're doing this competition a lot earlier than we normally do and i feel like that almost helped us a bit because we were able to say like winter break is work on problems time uh, and i think that was kind of better than having the like final rush be in the middle of classes. So um, that might have helped us out a bit so we could kind of finish everything up and not have to worry about classes while we we're doing so. So every every one of these problems has sort of two components. There's the just straight up algorithmic, what is the problem you have to solve component. But then we also try and get these problems to have some sort of story. Are there elements you like to see in a good uh, HSPC problem story. Yeah, I mean, I like it when they've got, you know, some element of humor. Um, I actually kind of, after I did the advent of code one year, I started trying to model uh, some of the stories and looking for stories that were kind of like that. Because um, I feel like the writing style and the kind of mix of humor, but also like getting the information to the, uh, to the programmer, like, that, that author's got a pretty good mix, so that's been a pretty big inspiration for me, at least. Um, although I haven't written anything that long, but... <laughs> I, I like to see uh, at least one or two problems that are kind of minds-themed. Um, so this year, M-Climb is the minds-themed one, um, referring to our annual tradition of hiking up all of the freshmen to the, to the M on Mount Zion, and then painting the rocks that they bring, as well as the students uh, and, and paint. Um, and in the past, we've had other uh, minds themed ones. Uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago in 2018, we had one um, that was based on um, our E days tradition of, of pulling an ore cart all the way down to the Capitol along Colfax Avenue. So uh, just a lot of really um, uh, fun kind of hearkening back to the fact that these are written by minds students and alum um, and they are specific for this competition so how do you think running this sort of competition at the high school level 
um, differs from a college level competition like the um, uh, ACM intercollegiate programming competition? Um, is it organized very differently? Like, are, are the poems formatted much differently? Is it a, a, a different scoring process? Yeah, so we use the same uh, scoring, like the same software and stuff uh, that they use at the like higher level. Um, and I think the problems, at least uh, to me, they seem pretty similar. Um, uh, the difficulty at the college level can be pretty crazy, um, but in terms of like how they're written in the format and stuff, uh, it's roughly the same here as well. Um, in terms of running it, I would say it feels a little less um, like formal. Uh, like ICPC is like pretty big and like a, a worldwide competition and they have to, you know, really get it right and make sure Cadis is set up with all the teams and stuff. Um, whereas we have a little bit more wiggle room here because, um, you know, if something doesn't work out or someone signs up with the wrong email, it's not like the end of the world. Uh, so the fact that it's a bit more informal uh, kind of makes it a little easier, but we do try to keep all the problems in the competition uh, so it uh, is similar to ICPC. And just some news on the leaderboard. It looks like River Hill has taken both first and second place. Both teams have 10 problems solved. Um, Lions is in third currently with also 10 problems solved, but uh, the tiebreaker is there on time. That's very impressive because River Hill in particular was uh, I, I, Sumner did a whole bunch of statistics going into this competition to try and guesstimate who would be victorious, and River Hill was not on our list. They're definitely a dark horse this year, new new to the competition. They have done amazing. Yeah, and speaking of speaking of uh, uh, the ICPC, uh, we actually were on a team a couple years ago, and that was a ton of fun. Um, and most definitely, we did not win, um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, yeah, the problems are, are much more difficult. You know, M problem M was, would maybe be kind of a lower mid tier to, you know, middle of the mid tiers problem in a, in an intercollegiate programming competition. So, um, that just kind of gives you an idea of the scale, you know, there, uh, um, of, of the problem. So it can go much higher. So. Um, Jack, in addition to sort of running this whole event, you also authored three of the problems. Uh, problem A, which is the first one we expect a lot of teams to solve, uh, D and I. Um, so uh, I thought it would be fun if we just went through some of these. Could you explain roughly like what the structure of these problems were and how you expect teams to solve them? Yeah. So. Um, a is essentially the exact same as the E days one we had last year. Uh, you're given three numbers um, with a story about minds as kind of the, the backstory. Um, and the trick to it is recognizing that the third number is totally useless uh, and you just want to multiply the first two. Um, so that was M and uh, I wasn't really too original with it. Basically took E days and changed the story. Um, uh, the other one was D, uh, so that was the tall enough one. Um, so that one is, uh, the idea is that they have to check to see if um, any of the people that are trying to get on a roller coaster uh, have a height less than 48, where the input is just a list of heights. And they want to say true if everyone is above 48 uh, or equal to 48, and false if anyone is less than 48. Uh, so this I uh, kind of based on a lot of problems I've seen um, uh, in the computer science 101 class. Um, one thing that you know people have to do a lot is a for loop with some kind of accumulator and keeping track of you know, if it turns false uh, or if it stays true throughout. Uh, so I kind of added this one because it's a problem I've seen come up before. And yeah, I thought it wouldn't be too challenging um, as, yeah, it's just a for loop. Um, and I guess and, I is, yeah, tic-tac-toe solver. Um, that one just determined if someone's won a tic-tac-toe board. So you can either hard code all the different solutions, 
um, with lots of copying and pasting, or you can try and be like clever and uh, and like use for loops and stuff to avoid having to copy and paste so much code. Um, I, yeah. I is a really interesting one to me because I feel like a lot of these problems have a sort of split between they're very conceptually easy, but maybe implementing them is very difficult versus, uh, you know, it takes a lot to parse the problem. But then once you have, it's fairly easy. And, and you've kind of authored both types here. You've got incline where you have to really read through the story and understand what the point is before you just pull two numbers out versus tic-tac-toe where everyone knows what a tic-tac-toe board is. <laughs> But it's actually quite a lot of code to read one and determine whether it's winning. Mm -hmm. So, did you have uh, any specific inspiration for these problems, like the stories behind them? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, in terms of the stories, uh, they basically so the tic tac toe. Um, I, I've tried to like code up tic tac toe before and have found the part of like how do you check if someone's win. Uh, if someone's won to be kind of an interesting problem that, you know, on its surface is like, yeah, just three in a row, uh, but ends up kind of turning into more code than you would expect. So that was kind of why I wanted to do that one, because uh, just from experience. Uh, and then like tall enough, I actually came up with the idea um, uh, beforehand uh, for like wanting to have a for loop and an accumulator, um, specifically because I like to uh, write a lot of Haskell code, right? Um, I want to do something that was just like a, a fold over some kind of monoid thing. Um, and so like that doesn't really matter at all for the problem, but that was kind of the inspiration was uh, kind of taking that uh, kind of design or coding pattern uh, and making it into a problem. So we actually have a couple of solutions that people have come up with for these problems available here. Uh, and I love it if we take a look at them and you can tell us if there's anything particularly surprising about them or if uh, you think teams are approaching these in about the way you'd expect. Yeah, so here's here's problem D. This is uh, tall enough, as you mentioned. Um, this is the first team to solve. This is River Hill High School Team 2. And uh, I think they're the first to solve. Maybe... I think I got that wrong. They, they were not first to solve, but they, they solved at three minutes. Um, they, yes, they were, uh, Spanish Inquisition was the first to solve this one. Um, they also solved it at three minutes. So it was very close between these two teams in this case. Yeah, I would say though that looks pretty much how I would expect it. Like um, plenty of Java stuff for parsing and getting input. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that they uh, kind of flipped the Boolean value. Um, so, like, if the Boolean is true, then they print false. Otherwise, they print true. Um, but, yeah, that's basically exactly what I would expect. <laughs> well, I think that part of the reason they did that is so that they could break out of the loop here um, <laughs> if they ever found one that is less than 48, because that's the that's the condition for a false. Yeah, that's... but you could also flip it, right? Or Yeah, obviously. Yeah. But I think it's, uh, it's not unreasonable it to sense. have yeah. uh, thought about it like that. It's kind of interesting that they actually bothered to break out of the loop here because in a real programming environment, you would always want to do that because it's more efficient. But uh, in a programming competition like this, where especially the first problems you want to solve it fast, you don't really need that just to get the right answer. And it's an extra line of code and more thought about control flow they had to put into this. Yeah, and I think the bounds of this are such that you totally don't like need that break. But, you know... They solved it very quickly, nonetheless. So, let's look at um, uh, uh, tic tac toe. I believe we have tic tac toe. This is the first. Yep. Te they were the first, same team, first team to solve uh, problem I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're going through every row. I'm guessing in that first for loop. Or yeah, this, yeah, row. yeah. And then hard coding the diagonals. Yeah, I think actually this does both row and column. Oh, yeah, I see. Um, because the indices, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> Lots of breaks. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and then these are the these are the hard coded diagonals. Yeah, that's definitely that's basically how I ended up solving it. Um, and I think yeah. that's how you were probably expecting. Yeah, no, I think that's roughly the same as the Python code I had. Um, and then yeah, even checking to see if the first one is an X or an O to decide who won. Um, Oh yeah, I see. I see. I didn't realize that it was an and here checking the equality of all those. Yeah, that that seems like a fairly reasonable solution. Um, we so, have some news on the leaderboard. River Team High School Team One has solved all but E already. So uh, this may be a very short competition for the for the top the top slots. Um, uh, so. Guess we have to pull out some uh, uh, graph theory plus I don't know what can we oh we could probably do some some stuff with I was actually thinking of uh, next year like making some well I guess I shouldn't talk about it on a stream but oh, we'll have to make it really hard. Next year's <laughs> this is definitely I think the strongest like I don't think our problems were necessarily any. You know, I think they're easier than last year, but I don't think that they're easier than any of the previous years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and the hardest problem is still hard. The hardest three problems, at least, I think are very, very difficult. Um, but I think it's just a testament to the strength of the competitors this year. High school students are always interesting because they can really, really surprise you. I feel like to a certain extent, like coming out of college, you sort of know what difficulty, like, uh, what what people have learned, but high school students can sometimes be just in their own time have learned all, a lot of the content you'd expect in college, and so <laughs> just come out of the blue and be like, "Yep, yeah, uh, solid polynomials, graph theory, dynamic programming, we got this." Right, and I think you know, like you mentioned, uh, coming out of college, it's a lot a lot easier to judge how they're going to do, and that's uh, that you know you kind of know that once you get up to the sort of algorithms like graph theory, min max, uh, min flow max cut or whatever that one is, you know, that those sorts of things, those are going to be starting to be on the harder side um, of at least of the mid range. Um, so it uh, looks like we lost Jack. So let's just talk oh, no. back to uh, talking here. Uh, I think he had to go to see uh, something with the, with the, uh, uh, some of the competitors. Um, Jack has more important things to yeah. hang out with us. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So thanks very much, Jack, for joining us. And let's yeah, transition here. Back to the scoreboard. 